Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Metropolitan Opera's virtual summer camp, global opera summer camp. I'm Paula Swazi. I am the executive stage director of the Metropolitan Opera, and I'm volunteering my time with the education department to talk to a couple of wonderful artists who have been involved with Hansel and Gretel. Um, you won't see them when you get to watch the opera this week, but um, they've both been in this production, so I thought it would be fun to talk to them. So I'm going to welcome Tara Eracht, who is coming to us, I believe, from Ireland. Here she is. Hi, Tara. Hello. And Hedda Hesang Park. Who, Hi. Hey. And Hedda, where are you right now? I'm in Berlin right now. I can see a beautiful sun through the window. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, so I'm actually in Wisconsin. Uh, I live in New York City, but I'm visiting. I used to live in Wisconsin, so I'm here visiting family, and um, we needed a little break from the city. And we have people coming from all over the world. As you guys start chatting in, tell us where you're from. Um, if you have questions as we go through this, I would just ask that you type the word question in all caps and then put your question underneath and say where you're writing from. We will do our best to answer questions. We actually have a bunch of new uh, pre-questions already ready to go. Um, so we're gonna do what we can. We've got about an hour and uh, I'm really happy to be here. So. To start, this is um, one of the things that I like to do with people. I stole it from somebody else, but it's really fun, <laughs> is to make everybody who talks to me do their 90 second life story, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, I will load up the time on my phone. And <laughs> oh my of course, God. Of course, I'm not gonna stop you if you're, especially if you're in the middle of a good part of your story, but it's just to kind of get a sense of maybe where you were born. It's a good place to start where you grew up. And then, you know, if there's anything significant in there, if you want to start jumping to how you got to where you are today. Okay. okay. So I'm going to start with Tara and I've got my timer loaded <laughs> up. <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so stand by and go. Ready? Okay. So I was born in Dublin, Ireland. I grew up there, went to secondary school and everything here studied in Dublin at the Royal Irish Academy of Music and in my third year of my undergrad degree I was offered a place on the Young Artist Programme at the Bavarian State Opera in Munich and luckily for me the university allowed me to travel over and back and do my final year and my first year in the studio at the same time um, so that was quite an incredible thing. After two years in the studio I was offered a full-time job so I was a resident principal soloist for another eight years so ten years altogether in Munich and during that time, I also got to guest a lot. So I got to do loads of traveling. And that's also when I made my, during that period of time, I made my Met debut. Um, trying to think of the important things. <laughs> the craziest thing I did in that time was a colleague got sick. And in the European system, they don't keep covers because usually somebody can fly from another city, but nobody else knew this role. It was Romeo in the Capuletti e Montecchi from Bellini. Uh. And in four and a half days, I learned it. Whoa. And I did the premiere and all the shows. So that's maybe a good, a good crazy thing. I met Hera in 2015 when I made my American opera debut um, in <laughs> Washington singing Cenerentola. And Hera came to Washington to visit. And since then, we've traveled together a lot. We've been in the same cities a lot. Um, and we got to know each other really well. So I was so happy when I got to sing Hansel and Gretel at the Met. And she was there. And we had weeks and weeks together. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Well done. That was 90 seconds. That was perfect. And I love that. <laughs> like, what's the craziest story? That was really amazing. And for those of you who don't know, a cover is what we call an opera an understudy. So that's one mm -hmm. sort of technical term. And the reason, as Tara mentioned in her quick 90 seconds, that you, a lot of European houses don't have covers is because all of the cities are so close, right? So for yeah. an opera that everybody knows, like Butterfly or Bohème, people can jump in, they can fly from Berlin to London in an hour. Like it's a very easy, um, you can get people close by quickly. 
So yeah. a lot of the houses don't keep covers. Now at the Met, we do. We are required actually by our union agreement to have covers mm -hmm. for all the roles. And because, you know, even though in the US we have like Boston and DC and Philadelphia near us in New York, it's still a big, there's a big trip between like San Francisco or Chicago and New York, which is where the singers who are singing lead roles have comparable size voices for our house. Um, good, so thank you, that was very good. Now I'm gonna go to Hera and you can do your best little mini. Okay, I did, I did okay. my best. Stand by, ready, go. Uh, so my name is Hera Hesang Park. I'm soprano coming from South Korea. And um, I was in, actually my dream was to become a comedian because I was pretty good at the mimicking with other people's sound. But somehow my mom brought me to the piano teacher and um, at the end of the piano lesson, I had a 10 minutes of singing lesson. I enjoyed it more that time than pl playing the piano. So she brought me to the choir and then I spent my 10 years in the choir. Uh, since then, everything seems like so natural for me to go this journey as a singer. I really was not serious uh, about the opera until my 20th. But one day when I saw the La Traviata, I was so into it. I was, I was in my tears, like I couldn't really stop uh, not to cry. <laughs> so uh, at the time I figured it out, okay, maybe I really like the opera. And since then I went to America and uh, studied in Juilliard School and uh, became a member of the Young Artists at the Met. And uh, my first role at the Met was another fairy role uh, as a Rusalka, uh, in Rusalka. And the uh, second one was Hansel and Gretel with Tara. Great, so, well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I don't think I realized, Hera, that when we worked together on Rusalka, that was your first official Yes, that role. was my first debut at the Met, yes. Oh my goodness. So that was my second year at the Met. <laughs> So uh, you guys will see Rusalka in, I think it's two weeks time is when mm. we'll see Rusalka. So you'll see Hera in that and she gets yeah. lifted up. She has to sing. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's very physical, um, mm. which I think is something I'd love to talk to you guys about. So, so, and we didn't say, but Tara is a mezzo. Hera is a coloratura soprano, right? Is that sort of, I mean, there's all sorts of ways to describe voices. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm curious to know about like some of the, so Tara already talked about learning a huge role with a ton of notes. For those of you who don't know that opera, mm -hmm. it is Bellini's version of the Romeo and Juliet story. We're going to see Gounod's version of the Romeo and Juliet story in two or three weeks. I don't have the schedule in front of me, but we will see it during summer camp. Um, and this uh, Bellini version, there's tons and tons and tons of notes. It's really complicated <laughs> and it's in a different language. Did you right. know the Romeo and Juliet before you studied the Bellini? No. No, I did <laughs> not at all. And, you know, it was only my first year in the ensemble. So I'd only just left the Young Artists Program. So it was a very big <laughs> risk, but also you know, the brain was really fresh. And another thing that's a little bit different sometimes in the European system, that because they have such a big turnover of operas, they often keep a souffleur or a, or a um, what's prompter. In English? A prompter, a yeah. prompter. So you also have somebody there if you need to tell them, oh, this is a little sticky bit for me, or can you really help me here? So there you know i was very lucky with somebody there that i really trusted um so you also always had somebody kind of nearly like a jiminy cricket on your shoulder <laughs> <laughs> and give you little hints let's talk about a prompter you probably won't notice it in the version that you guys will see because they mm -hmm. don't usually shoot from mm. the uh, far enough out where you see the little prompter's box but at the right. metropolitan opera most of our operas we do have a prompter and 
part of that comes from the fact that at least when I started at the Met in the early 90s, a long time ago, um, you know, we were having cast changes very often during mm. pr production. So we'd have 13 performances of Figaro and we might have four different Figaros, three right, different right. contestants. You know, we would just be transferring people over. Um, mm -hmm. So in the Hansel and Gretel, I know since we do it in English, there is no prompter in this production at the Met, but <laughs> most of them do. And so we could talk a little bit, just the prompter sits facing the singer, mm -hmm. facing the stage. They're in a little box that covers from their back. They have video cameras that face them. So if I'm the prompter and I'm looking at the stage, I have video cameras that face me on the conductor so that because I am a musician primarily and I am with the conductor, I have the score in front of me. And I often, well, some prompters prompt every line, like one beat so that they stop talking one beat before the singer starts singing and then they help cue the singer in. Some prompters, you know, will only prompt if a singer wants their help, but knowing that in music, unlike in a play, if you miss your line, it's over. Like you're not getting that line back <laughs> because the orchestra is still playing, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, if you miss it, it's gone. If you take, for example, Hansel and Gretel. So I also sing the exact same production, but I, I premiered it in German. Okay. So as an English speaker, I learned the role in German. I had sung it nearly 30 times before I did it <laughs> in the Met. And I went there having to learn it now in English in mm. a beautiful poetic translation. So everything rhymed, um, but not always word for word, uh, the translation. So, cause oftentimes when I sing in a foreign language, I kind of am translating from English in my, in my head. And this mm. time I had to nearly learn it like it was brand new. And the very interesting thing was we had Gerhard Siegel sang the witch in our production and he had it was a an, he's a german tenor it was a role debut for him um and he also had to learn it in english <laughs> oh i didn't know it was his role <laughs> debut so much fun you know because oh it was so incredible to get to do it together and to discover also how interesting it is in english and it was only my second opera ever that didn't have a prompter right. and we all kind of knew each other well enough in the cast that if anybody was a little bit stuck, we could help, you know, we could hint a little bit or <laughs> wink, and, wink. Um, I find that really interesting as well, you know, that we were able mm -hmm. to do that. Sometimes you also notice that the conductors are mouthing every word yeah, and they don't always realize they do that. Um, but that can also be very helpful because <laughs> if you miss one word, it's gone. So you have to also know in your mind how to jump and, and move on. And if a okay. colleague misses something or something happens, you also have to be able to just <laughs> jump in. Oh, in right. the next you have to place. get in on the right place. So that's why the prompter is, it's, they're like, a and gift from got heaven up there. Sometimes <laughs> because they'll put up their hands and show you, okay, wait, one, two, three, go. go. Right. And they'll bring you back in and, and kind of fix everything. Right. Um, and that's an interesting thing. I'm curious, Hera, when you were making your Met debut, and, and of course on this production as the Dew Fairy, you're alone on stage, right? I There's, was alone. Yes. Yeah. And so yes. like, were you nervous? What, like, how do you handle that? And then we have a question from Isabella DeMasi about what's a tip you have for young performers and you guys are way younger than I am. So I'd be, love to hear you talk about that a little bit. Hedda, maybe you can have a tip for young <laughs> well, performers. Um, when I actually uh, sang the dress rehearsal, we had another uh, wonderful students came over to the Met to see this. Uh, do you remember, Tara? It was, like, I think, dress rehearsal. Many young students came over to see the dress rehearsal at the time. And I entered the stage from the wing and like shaking my extra <laughs> sponge uh, butt and uh, go on the stage and I lift up the curtains and the engineer behind me is literally uh, with the point of the when I'm lifting my hands up the curtains are up 
and uh, I remember at the time they clapped and then shout as if I am like opening like such a good scene. And then I remember such a good feeling at that time. So in those cases, I lose all the tension or uh, nervousness and I can really enjoy it. I think it's really coming from the audience every day, every night. Uh, we actually feel um, from the audience very deeply, even though they're not talking, they're really quiet, doesn't matter. We really feel in the, in the hall, we feel the energy and that energy really gives me a lot of mood to move forward and then let it go and uh, make the music even more naturally and uh, comfortably. So I always wish, like today, I hope the audience are good. <laughs> Right. I think that's so interesting, Hera. I'm glad you yeah. brought that up because I know one of the things that we're talking about right now is can we do performances without an audience just to try to create performances? Yeah. And it really right. is so important to have all the people out there breathing with you and helping Absolutely. you go forward, right? And yes. I know, Tara, you just did a recital in Ireland, right? Um, exactly. With an empty house. So how did that feel? It was incredibly strange. Um, I did a, so a recital with piano at the National Concert Hall in Dublin. And when I was a student, I worked as an usherette. So I used to show people to their seats in the hall. So it's a, it's a theater I know very well. Um, front of house, backstage and everything. And um, in the rehearsals, I thought, oh, this is very normal, you know, because there were there was a stage manager and a lighting guy. And the strange thing is, I know these people since I was like 17 and yet we couldn't hug or shake hands or it was like waving from a distance. I thought, oh, it's a little strange, but it wasn't until we got to the performance. And when I walked out on stage, I couldn't even feel the heat from the people in the room. Mm. And I thought, oh. and I was a bit shell shocked. You know, it was really mm. strange. And the only thing I can say is that I was so very grateful to get to sing. Yeah. I mean, I need to sing. It's like the oxygen in my lungs, I need it. I was so grateful to get the opportunity. And I, I just thought about all the people sitting at home who maybe had been in lockdown alone or people who were suffering and people who needed the music. So I left myself in the dressing room and forgot all those things. And I sang for the people. Um, now, when it was over, <laughs> I cried for like 10 minutes because I, I didn't even understand what was happening because I'm so used to performing also with the audience. Yeah. And if you take the last performance I had done before, that was the dress rehearsal for Cenerentola in New York. And we had an audience full of children from school and the energy, the, the, the excitement that they pumped into our show for us yeah. without us doing anything, just the fact that they were there and, and full of energy. It was this kind of out of body experience. It's incredible. And I wish everybody could experience that, like also from the important, from the, uh, excuse me, from the, our point of view, like from the stage yeah. Um, because we see, we feel every person. And yeah. I think every audience member knows they're so important. Yeah, and it's interesting. There's a lot of science actually about, oh, our neighbors are mowing the lawn. There's a lot of science <laughs> about, um, can you guys still hear me? Is it okay? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll close the window. Um, about breathing together. I can hear you, but I can't hear Heysung. <laughs> That's okay. Let's see. Hang on. Close that. I can tell by your face saying <laughs> what you say. Um, hey, son. <laughs> so, yeah, there's some science about everybody breathing together and what that means and um, how important that is. So, that would be a fun research project. So, we've gotten a lot of questions. Um, yeah. And I'm going to just throw a few out for you guys to think about. So, one is we get like, what's your favorite opera? What's your favorite opera song, which we call Aria. So think about that while I want to see if Dan has um, a video question for us, because we did have a few people record video questions. So maybe we can pop that up because I always find the what's your favorite opera so hard to answer. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that. Um, 
Dan, do you have a video question for us? If you do, pop it up. And... Hi, my name is Michaela and I'm from California. My question is, what is your favorite opera that you have performed in? All right, there we go. So who wants to take it first? Hera, do you have a favorite opera um, one and then maybe a favorite opera that you've performed in? So we'll do both. I actually just remember that I sang a Rosina. Um, the opera is like the Barber Seville um, uh, by, uh, by Rossini. And uh, I sang in Glanborn. We had 15 times of performances, so it was a very long run. But it was just so incredible. Somehow I really attached to this character and I, I don't even, I didn't need to even worry. Somehow, somehow, I don't know why, but because I was so attached to this character, I was not nervous and I had so much confidence to go on the stage and um, I just left, I, I, I became me and that was really a bizarre experience. I didn't need to pretend to be a someone else, it was just so me and because of that memory, I really liked it and one just small episode was while I was jumping and then dancing, while I was singing the aria Una Voce Poco Fa, I was wearing like a long silk dress and I stepped on the silk dress and I fall down, like re literally my ankle is still hurts, oh. but, and then my high heel broke. <laughs> so like I saw, I, I heard from the audience saying like, oh, you know, <laughs> But in the in the meantime, I thought, okay, this is hilarious, but it's okay because it's part of the character. So I just stood up and then I pretended it was kind of an acting and I moved on to the, um, the next phrase and I finished the aria and I, I really received really great um, um, applause they say, like, applause yeah. from people. They like, oh, wow, you were so brave. I thought you were going to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing couldn't stop me. So I think that's the that's so far my one of favorite uh, roles I've done in my Amazing. life in my career. How about you, Tara? Do you have a favorite I opera mean, and a favorite opera that you've been in? The, I'm very lucky that I kind of let I nearly have two types of opera because as a mezzo, sometimes I play a girl and sometimes I play a boy. Um. And my favorite boy opera is for sure Hansel and Gretel for two reasons, right? Two reasons. It's the most choreographed dancing opera I've ever been in. So um, it's mm. like really active and it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Oh, there's oh, there's a, great a wild photo. And to um, answer, somebody did, ask, <laughs> somebody did ask what parts you guys played. So Tara, that's Tara as Hansel. She played Hansel and Hansel and Greta, that's yes. kind of the role. And Hera played the Dew Fairy. There she is. Oh, and you're in so this cute. production, the Dew Fairy <laughs> is like a little maid. She comes in and cleans everything up. Yeah, in the magic. Oh my God, <laughs> sweet. Sorry, keep going, Tara. So Hansel's an amazing role. The music, it's all incredible, okay? But the gift, the extra <laughs> gift in this show, is that in the third act, I won't give anything away, but in the third act where poor Gretel is incredibly busy and she's given 10,000 jobs to do, I just lie there on the table eating and being fed and eating. And it's amazing things like what's in the med, it was Nutella and Oreos, and <laughs> cream and oh, incredible. It's so tasty. The stuff is so good and I don't have to sing at all. Gretel runs around doing all these jobs and she has big arias and I just lie there and eat all the tasty things. It's amazing. Um, and this year I'll sing like my 45th performance of this production. And it's always fresh cakes every night. <laughs> So it's, I mean, it's an amazingly brilliant role in that sense. Um, and the other thing then in the absolute extreme, I also then get to do a role like Cenerentola, which is Cinderella, mm -hmm. where, I mean, it's an amazing story. And then you get to go from these rags to incredible ball dresses, wedding dresses, you know, when you get to be the princess and the prince, you meet the prince and, you know, I get the best of both worlds. And I would say for those of you, if you haven't seen it, 
Chenna Rental is a fantastic um, version of the Cinderella opera because what Rossini adds in that isn't really in the fairy tale is he actually, it's almost like a little test to find somebody with a good heart. So it's not just mm -hmm. about, they don't just fall in love because she's pretty. Yeah. They fall yeah. in love because she's kind. And mm -hmm. Rental was one of the very first operas I ever directed, like way, oh. way, way back. Oh. I did a small version of it. Like this was mm -hmm. like 1989. Um, I'm starting to get a sense <laughs> how long I've been doing this. But you know, it really struck me as so brilliant because he mm -hmm. takes he takes that story, which is a great fairy tale, but he expands it a little bit and we get to see a little bit more of the humanity. And it's not just mm -hmm. about like, you look a certain way, so you get the print. Right. And I just love mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. of course, yeah. Tara and I um, had a great hug backstage. It was probably March 5th. And <laughs> we were both like, oh wait, we're not supposed to be hugging each other. And then we are oh. like, oh, it's too late. Do yeah. <laughs> you remember that? I mean, it was like a week before <laughs> yes. we shut down and she was just about to go out for her um, Chenarentula rehearsal that I had popped into. And somebody asked in the chat, um, what is it like to be backstage at the Met? And I'm gonna start mm -hmm. and I'm gonna say, it's like being in another world because the Met is, we have the stage that's on stage, which is about mm -hmm. 70 feet wide, 50 feet deep, like it's huge. Mm -hmm. But on stage left, stage right, and the rear stage are also equivalent size spaces. And there are sound doors at each one. So you can either have it be a very intimate backstage space with just a little hallway in each location. But some shows play with the sound doors open. And then it's like you walk off stage and suddenly you're in this well-lit like place where people are working on the next set that's about to go on stage or there's quick changes happening. We mm -hmm. set up, sometimes there's like a quick change booth for 50 people up at the back. You know, it's a it's a very funny um, place because it's huge and there are a lot of people doing their work. Um, so that's always my experience is that juxtaposition between being what, what the audience is seeing right now and what's happening back here to get ready for what the audience is about to see. Um, I don't know if either of you have a thought about that sort of what's it like to be backstage at the Met? Mm. Hera, do you want to? I've oh, certainly yes. gotten lost many, <laughs> many times. Yeah. Ah, you've gotten lost. <laughs> I have for her to get like, a, this is that, this is that, because I was a young artist at the Met for three years. I knew pretty well. So every time Tara came, the first day I went to, I went to Tara and I, Tara, this floor is going to this direction. This is going to this direction. I always guided her. I remember the story. <laughs> it's pretty big. It's 10 floor total, no? Like yeah. uh, from the top of the bottom, right? That's right. That's right. It's uh, very it, easy to get lost. It is, and only some, only some floors go the whole way across because it's actually two buildings put together. And so uh -huh. you can't That's the thing. you can't always get front of what we call front of house, which is where the audience is, back of house, you know, there's like costume shops and scene shops and paint shops. Right. And you can't get to, you can't always get across because sometimes you're where the stage is, right? Where the height of the fly system is. So there's no way to cross. I have spent time like, oh wait, I can I, get like here. last I time get the elevator. <laughs> Last time when I sang the Orfeo Euridice and then I was Amor, I flew from the top actually. And I fell with this, uh, how do you say? Oh um, yeah, the harness. The yeah, harness. harness. I wore the harness and then I had to fly from the, the ceiling to the down, uh, to the ground of the stage. And it was so bizarre experience. It was so high, so high. <laughs> And you have to be up there before for a long time because you get yeah. you have to go up. So this is a, yeah, you put the harness on in your in your dressing room, and a person comes in to check it to make sure yeah, that it's secure. Every somebody who is certified. Yep. Yeah. Then when you get called to places, you have to go up, and you have to wait up yeah. there for quite a while, right, before you get hooked yeah. up. And then yeah, I was for like a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, and so you're not afraid of heights. I was almost pee in the beginning, <laughs> I would say. 
because it's scary. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but it's it was really funny experience. Like I. I actually said, I felt like, wow, I conquered the body, you know, like I literally, I remember during the, one of the rehearsal, technical rehearsal, I literally shouted once I flew and then started to see the whole scenery of the audience. It was just so amazing, overwhelming feeling. So I literally said like, wow, I feel like I conquered the mid. And then <laughs> <laughs> everyone could, could hear what I said. I was not ashamed because I thought it was already very incredible courage. I would do it right now. So it was an yeah. experience. An experience. Did they start usually when we have to fly somebody, we actually put them on the stage floor and we mm -hmm. lift them like six feet off the ground mm -hmm. and make sure that the harness feels okay because of course Absolutely. suddenly their whole body weight is in it. And yeah, usually we rehearse down in the ballet studio, there's a hookup and so that we can yes. lift the singer, right? So that you can figure out how to support yeah. your voice when your feet mm -hmm. aren't on the ground. So for any of you campers who are singers, you know that part of what you need to do is like plant your feet and you have to support mm -hmm. your column in order to project your voice. And that all changes when your feet aren't on the ground. And mm -hmm. suddenly the weight and you know the harness has to be adjusted one, so that it's safe, but two, so that you can actually do what you need to do. And so there's a lot of time spent rehearsing with you just like just barely off the ground. And once they have the harness set comfortably, then they slowly practice like lifting you higher and higher. And then they do the, okay, now we're gonna roll you in from the top, which must be just, you know, it's one of those things like after all the practice, you have to just take the leap and try it. and or not be hopefully, but yeah. And somebody did ask, how do you project your voice to the back of the hall? Mm. And it of course starts with support. Um, I don't know if you guys wanna expand upon that a little bit. Um, I will say, I know that the Met acoustically is fantastic, mm -hmm. which is helpful, but there's a lot more to it. So you wanna start, Tara? Tell us a little bit about- Sure, that. I mean, the- the big difference, I suppose, with the Met is that it's certainly the biggest place I've ever sung. And it's twice as big as most European houses. So I even remember the day of my audition. Um, they had me sing. And then they said, OK, now sing as quiet as you possibly can. Um, and it was Carabino they asked me to sing. So quite a short Mozart aria um, with piano. And they told me like really almost a whisper. And then I was able to hear that the acoustic mm -hmm. in that room is incredible. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing, and the thing every other singer tells you is do not push or force the sound because the room does it for you. So really important, certainly for me anyway, really important when I'm there is to remember the support that I learned. Support is really just good breathing and no pressure here at all keeping everything here nice and calm and to remember that the room is going to do the work for you and um, diction is very important and um, that was also the interesting thing with Hansel and Gretel I don't sing a lot in English ever um, and I was very very lucky that the music staff at the Met were really patient because <laughs> my Irish accent can be quite deceptive also sometimes and I speak quite far back but singing, we've got to do all the diction right here on the top of the lips. And uh, the music staff had to really <laughs> um, instill that in me because otherwise the text didn't travel to the back of the room. So diction is also really, really important in every language, but especially um, in English when everybody in the audience can speak the language. It's coming from. So, yeah. Support. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it helps you. I think the diction, I always remember people talking about singing in German that actually don't try to pretend like there aren't consonants, use them, like use that to help you bring your voice forward into, yeah. Totally. I mean, I'm not a musician, that's not what I do. But um, Hera, do you wanna talk a little bit about, you know, um, how you project your voice and what you think about? At the Met, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, I projection 
I think it's everything is like uh, based on the technique. And actually, if I can be super honest, it's not a matter where I am. So if you feel secure with your technique, then technique has shouldn't be changed no matter what in the different places. It should be the same. And when I actually went to the competition and one of the judge was uh, uh, Sir Richard Boning, who was the very like... Uh, still like amazing conductor in our lifetime in the past so who supposed to know is the bel canto singing and he he told me one day hey i know you're the young artist at the med and just remember med is built extremely fantastic way so you don't need to force as tara said just right now you don't need to force your voice just sing it and make it piano then even it's gonna be even better and then that was there was um that was hard to, for me, it was very hard to believe once you go on the stage and you see the <laughs> giant, giant, just like open space, you really tempt to, oh my God, yeah, you really tempt to Push. fight for it. Yeah, you become a warrior, but um, to hold this, your ego, it's the key, I think. Every Actually, every theater is to, to hold your ego and then really talking to yourself that you are here, to do your thing, your job and your love, but there's nothing more than that. So you don't need to prove how good you are by forcing, by show it. Um, instead of that, just believe what you've done, what how, how you prepared and just get it done well. Then the sound project is what it should be. I'm That's so how I glad you said that, Hera. You put mm. that so perfectly. Uh, this thank idea you. <laughs> that your technique is what it is, no matter mm -hmm. where you are, number one, right? So somebody asked some tips for young performers. I think that's number one. You get your technique in order with your teacher and that it may change over the years, but you have to learn how to check in and make sure you're singing well to protect your voice and that you leave your ego and you do you listen to the people around you as long as they're not asking you to do something that's hurting you right mm -hmm. and that's always a fine line but this idea i've had so many people come to the mat and be like oh my god i have to sing i have to push harder and so many other people say you actually don't you don't need to sing louder Mm -hmm. The mat is built beautifully for the voice so do what you are there to do and and relax into it. I think those are um, really important things for young singers to think about. So Dan, I would love it if you wanna pop up another video question for us and we'll take it. Hi, my name is Amelia and I'm in Washington, DC. My question is, what strategy do you use to calm down before a performance? Thank you. So that was Amelia asking about, I think, nerves and how do you keep calm before a performance? And we've had a couple of other people asking, do you feel nervous? What does your day look like? So I would love it if you wanted to give us a little snapshot into pre-performance and then how you handle nerves and just give us a little snapshot look at that. Mm -hmm. So Tara, you wanna take that first? Oh, maybe I've lost, you can't hear me. Here, I don't know what I did. Oh, okay, we can hear you. I pressed something, no doubt. Okay, we hear you. <laughs> um, so I'll with the earphones again. Hey, it's Dan from the Met. I think uh, Paula just backed out for a second here. Um, the question oh. is, can you hear me okay? Yes. There you are. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey, campers. Um, <laughs> let's just do the question one more time because it was such a good question. But the question is about how do you handle your nerves uh, before a performance? So here we go. Hi, my name is Amelia, and I'm in Washington, D.C. My question is... What strategy do you use to calm down before a performance? Thank you. 
I hit a button and then I got lost. And so Tara, Hello, did you Bob. Hi. All right. It was a question about how you calm the nerve. So head on, did you answer it? Did I miss it? No, I didn't answer. Yeah, I haven't. All right. So and Tara, can you hear us now? No. All right, Hedda, I'm gonna start yes. with you. So tell us okay. what you I can hear you. I can't hear you can't hear anybody else. Okay. So mm. we'll start I can no, but that's it. All right. Let me start with Hedda and okay. tell me what you do to calm your nerves beforehand um, um, before performance. So before the performance, everything has to be ready. Um, you shouldn't you shouldn't make yourself more stressed. So what I do is wake up very late. <laughs> so reduce the amount of like being awake. <laughs> so um, you have uh, enough rest, and then you have only short amount of the time to prepare the music, uh, because everything is already very much ready for the past few weeks with. Uh, wonderful, uh, productive rehearsals or something like that. So let's say you wake up around an 11 or even noon and, and you have a very nice um, breakfast. I always, always um, have a yogurt with a lot of fruits and then grains. And um, you cook a little bit uh, for the um, uh, dinner box, let's say, because the performance is normally in the dinner. So like uh, shopping for the banana or some chicken breast uh, or some salad and you're ready to go to the theater. And actually I am the person who feel a lot of um, um, anxiety before I go to the stage, even though I know that um, I, I don't, I, I've done enough uh, and I don't need to sell myself to the out there, but it's always the most unhappy moment <laughs> as an opera singer. Just before I go on the stage, I always have this like intense uh, nervousness and how I overcome is just like looking at me through the mirror and then keep telling me it's gonna be fine, it's gonna be fine. I'm sorry, I'm super honest to you guys, but I really am nervous. So I just see myself and telling myself, you're gonna be fine. And started to sing the um, uh, warming up the voice and see the music from the beginning to the end and go over it all again. So just remind what I am doing again. I always bring my music with me, every performances, even though I already memorize it, already know everything. And uh, breathe in and out, in and out, and just listening some meditative music or uh, pop music, something not so related with an opera sometimes. Uh, but what I really think is important for me is keep telling myself that you've done it enough. Let's just calm yourself, it's gonna be fine. And like, I'm just training myself with a positive energy. And then reducing the time of like feeling anxiety. And I think that's interesting, right? This idea that you've done your work beforehand. And so to focus on what you have to do in the story you told us about where when you were playing Rosina and you broke your heel and tripped yeah. over your skirt, you kept going, right? Like that yeah. wasn't something you were expecting to have happen, but exactly. you had done it enough. And people exactly. seem to ask like, what happens when things go wrong? And mm -hmm. things go wrong. It's live. Yeah, things can go on. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Anything There's can no perfection. Really. There's no perfection, right? We're not. No. We don't get another take. You have to keep going. Exactly. And it's kind of difficult to believe that we came from like um, a little bit of blackness, like uh, to accept that we were actually came from a little bit of blackness. Why we are always trying to be so perfect? Why we are always <laughs> trying to be so good? This question is always bothering me. So I. On the performance day, it's even like uh, coming harder. So I try to take this like little childish me out and like try to focus so many times. Right, and I always like to say in rehearsals, so when I'm directing, like our goal, we strive to be perfect. We strive to be wonderful, but we know that we never, we're human, we will never be perfect. Yes. And, 
that the process, the only way forward is actually through failure, right? Like in rehearsal, Absolutely. you want to fall over, you want to bump into the furniture, you want to sing the wrong note. Like that's the process. And I think that's sometimes when you only have three or four days, like what Tara was talking about before, yeah, you don't get the oh. to do that, right? So it's a different kind of pressure. But in a normal circumstance, hopefully, you have this time to fail and figure out what works and what doesn't work. Um, so Tara, can you hear us now? You're nodding your head, so I'm hoping you can hear I, us. I can hear you. Yay. <laughs> I would love you to answer the question, how do you calm your nerves before a performance and talk a little bit about your day and how that goes, the day of a performance in a normal circumstance. <laughs> yeah. So I am somebody who arrives at the theater very early, always very early, um, you know, three hours, sometimes four. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> it makes me feel good to be there. My big nightmare is that I'm late. I always have this dream <gasps> that someone calls me and they're like, where are you? <laughs> so I don't take any risks. I'm there early. I set up the dressing room, you know, put out all my little creams and whatever I have with me to make me feel good. Um, I usually go out then and get a coffee and I'll come back to the theater. I warm up very slowly. I walk around the set. I have another look um, at every door. Um, uh, I check on my colleagues, you know, just to say hello and see how everyone's doing. Um, because sometimes, you know, things change from show to show. And opera singers, you know, we, we are working with different colleagues all the time and things tend to change. So maybe in the middle of a show, you know, you'll remember something from another production of the same opera. You've got to be kind of alert and aware of how your colleagues feel that day and um, see what the mood is like. Cause you know, some things change and, and it's very helpful to also check in with your colleagues. Um, always just right before a show, I usually kind of try and take 20 minutes, just a little bit calm. As you can tell, I talk quite a lot. So usually what I do <laughs> is I close the dressing room door, I sit down, I make myself quiet. And once I'm dressed and in the costume, Tara's gone. And whoever I'm playing that day, if it's, you know, Rosina or Cenerentola, or if it's Hansel or Carabino, them. The minute I put on the shoes and the costume, that's it. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to think like them and, and what would they be doing? Especially, especially when it's a boy. Boys sit differently, boys walk around differently. And I try to get into that and that helps. And then, as most Irish people, <laughs> people laugh at me all the time. As most Irish people, just before I go on stage, I have to bless myself and say three Hail Marys because that's what we did at school. <laughs> <laughs> that's and great. Then off you go. Um, I was taught from the first singing lesson that my job and the, my, the thing that I have to do every day with this voice is tell a story. And when I remember that, the nerves go away yeah. because I don't worry about Tara or I don't worry about the voice or am I hungry or am I happy or sad or whatever. I just tell the story. And if everyone thinks of that, I can promise your nerves will go away. Hera and mm. I speak about this a lot, about mm. how to get yourself into the performance. I promise mm. if you're in the story, it'll make life much, much easier for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. I think it's wonderful advice. Somebody asked in the chat, what are you thinking and feeling when you're on stage right before the curtain goes up? And I think, and you can talk a little bit more if it's different. I know as a director, because I'm not a performer, I am often backstage right behind the curtain, right yeah. before it goes up, because I'm usually talking to the chorus to give a note, right? Like I always remember when we did Samson and Dalila, the only chance I really had to see all of the hundred coursers was on stage right before the curtain would go up. So I would wait and then we'd say, okay, shh. And then I would give a couple notes. And for me, it's a really exciting time because I love like, you can hear the audience starting to hush. So, you know, the house lights are going out. You can hear the tune. And then I'm like, okay, I gotta get off stage before it starts. You know, like it's to me that a rush of adrenaline comes and, mm. 
all I have to do is get off the stage, right? And then mm. I go watch and I take notes. I try to take notes during every performance except for the last one so that as things are happening, I can say, hey, Tara, remember we talked about this in rehearsal and it didn't, it's not quite working right. Should we try something else? Like it's an interesting, of course, difference for directors, but I'm curious, Tara, from what you said, I would think that by the time you're behind the curtain and we're about to go, you're in the character. But I don't know if there's something different, but or if you're there. Um, and Hera, well, when you're, for example, when oh. when you and I met, her, we did um, Hoffman, okay, right. and it was yeah. for me the first time on the Met stage. It was a, mm -hmm. a raked stage, and a raked stage is when the stage is at a, a slant. And I remember the very first night we went out, and I had, you know. 600 things to remember and 700 props yeah <laughs> and you had said to me in the dressing room listen remember you're going to be in your bare feet let's go out and look at the stage because the first thing i did was turn on a tap so there'd be a little bit of water and i remember that night thinking i've already done my stage walk i looked at every prop i never thought about that right. about mm. the water and only that you came and said to me remember you're going to be in your bare feet it's a different sensation when the water mm -hmm. comes Mm -hmm. And because you had told me that, I was able to stay in the character. But if you hadn't told me that, I would have gotten a shock because the water was cold and, you know, right. so they're really, really important moments. Well, I'm mm -hmm. glad I could do that with you. <laughs> so sweet. Hera, do you have anything about that moment right before the curtain goes up, what that feels like? I think that is the most exciting moment of the whole show, because once the curtains open, no matter what, you gotta do it. <laughs> there's no go back. There's no like uh, running away or no giving up. But this little like second of the moment is like uh, the moment from the Hezang to change that character moment for me. So I have like a lot of pumping in my heart. I literally can hear my heart from here. <laughs> but the curtain goes up and then ah, I remember one, one time the curtain was like, not instead of this curtain, it was more vertical curtain. And I saw the, the light came from the very bottom of the curtains. I was very much in the beginning of the, it was Rosalka actually, now I remember. Right I was laid right down. Yes. Yeah. I was laid down like a, a beautiful, like a fairy tale and I was posed myself, but my heart was so beating. And then I kind of like opened slowly my eyes and I saw this light came up from the, from the curtains. Um, and then the whole mood change. Like, once that pumping is finished, I don't, I don't, I, I forget who I was. I, and I you're forget. like in the world. I, yeah, it's so fascinating. I think that's the, that's the main reason why I love this job so much, even though it makes me so nervous and uh, requires a lot of demanding practice and a lot, lot of traveling and a lot of sacrifice. But the reason you still can so appreciate and so grateful is like you experience, experience something of magical, magical stuff uh, during the performance and you don't want to give up no matter what you have to do it the rest of your life. But this is just so, so, so shimmery for me. I cannot give up. <laughs> <laughs> so Dan, I think we have one more video question or we have a couple of pre questions that we might not have already answered. So pop one up for us and we'll. Hi, I'm Victoria from Maine in the US. My question for Tara is, what does a day in your life as an opera singer look like? Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. So Tara, and we'll have Hera do this too, but maybe give us a typical day, not a performance day. You want to give us a day like in rehearsal, what a day is like in for an opera singer. Sure. So a typical rehearsal day in New York, for example, is that actually Hera and I have done <laughs> a bar class 
So a fitness class. We went every morning. Every day. At 7 o'clock. 6 a.m. 7 o'clock. We'd go 7 <laughs> One to day, eight. It was two times 6 a.m. also. <laughs> wow. Um, we went every single day. And then <laughs> we'd shower, coffee, and then straight into the rehearsals. Rehearsals are 10. No, 10.30. 10 remember now. 10.30. 10 to 1.30. 10 o'clock yeah. to 1. That's it. 10.30 to 1.30. 1 yeah. And then an hour's lunch and 2.30 to 5.30. And it's an excellent way of doing things because you keep your, your concentration and then your evening is free. Um, when I'm in New York or in anywhere in America, I love to spend a lot of time at the movie theaters because the movies come out months before there months earlier than they do in Europe. So I try to see everything <laughs> before everyone else. Um, but the big difference for me is that a lot of the continental European system, they work from 10 o'clock till one o'clock and then they take a big break and they work again from 5 p.m. until 8 p.m. And so um, because that's the way I trained, um, it was a big shock for me the first time I worked in, in New York. And I, I remember I couldn't, I really found it hard to keep my nutrition in the afternoon. I mean, I was living on coffee and cookies trying to keep the sugar <laughs> up. But, um, you know, it, it's more important. And I would say as a tip to any young person, um, it's really important very early on to find out how to wind down in the evening because even a rehearsal can make you very excited and it can set your mind really busy so you have to find a way to wind down one of the things i do mm. is um a yoga with adrian bedtime yoga and i do that about 45 minutes mm. before i go to bed i love yoga with adrian <laughs> <laughs> so head <Hera, laughs> similar yes. for you a typical day when you're not performing but rehearsing so Yes, um, since uh, Tara was explaining about like the daily life during the rehearsal, maybe I'll focusing on like a non-rehearsal period and then right. just normal life, especially this time because of the old lockdown and then like a corona uh, pandemic, I really started to have my own routine. And what I do is I write three different things. Um, first one is highlight, and second one is habits, and third one is to-do list. And um, I started to make a routine because I didn't want to sink into the, this like, very negative situation we are having. So I wanted to make this time as a golden period for me. So what does that mean of like highlight is like, what do I see in 10 years? So I'm listing down with um, some future plan. Like uh, I would love to speak English even better. I would love to speak different languages. And I practice every day and I work out every day. And the second one is like habit. Uh, for example, like once you get up in the morning, just make your bed or making an eye contact when you're talking to somebody or calling to your parents every day, something like that. And the last one is like to-do list, like you have to go to the grocery shopping today or you have to find the tax, taxes like form or like whatever. That's kind of the list that I'm writing down every single day. And like following this uh, constant continuous uh, plans really made me feel so good. I've been already doing this for the last three months and I see the future already. Like I, I saw myself that my body shape uh, had been different and very like um, immune system became so healthy and so great. And uh, by practicing every single day, it's not losing this time. It's always uh, giving me a good energy because you know, like music is not just about like a soundtrack of our ex existence. You know, it can be a conductor of our well-being also. Mm. So I just, um, I just tried to do all this thing and then try not to lose anything, any of it, any of it, and uh, it makes me to move on to, uh, to be hopeful for the future. So That's I'm wonderful. looking forward to it. What a great thing for us to think about this idea of creating our own routines, especially right now when we're in this time. And mm -hmm. I too, I 
I like to get up in the morning and do my workout and, you know, cause with this hair, I only want to wash it once a day because it doesn't work. <laughs> otherwise. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming through. Um, I know people have been asking me like about costume fittings and haircuts. Mm. I will just say generally most companies, you have several costume fittings. If you have several costumes, the designer is there if it's a new production to make sure that their idea and sketch of what the costume is actually works on the performer's body and for what they have to do. Sometimes there's adjustments and well, usually there are adjustments once they start rehearsing in them. And in terms of hair, normally people are wigged um, sometimes people choose if they want to get their hair cut for a certain role, but not usually in opera. Usually we either work with what the, is there or they, or most women will be given a wig. Men mm -hmm. often will go without or, you know, it just depends on the role. But there mm -hmm. are no, we don't, the only issue is facial hair for men, right? So sometimes we have to say everybody clean shaven and we will give you the facial hair we want you to wear. So that's mm. really the only time in professional um, companies. Um, Dan, did we have any other questions? Cause we're right at time. So I wanna make sure we don't take up too much extra. Um, if not, I have one question from the chat that I saw that I'd love to go out on. So I love it, go for it. Hi everybody. Hi campers. Fearless <laughs> leader. So the question that I saw in the chat that I thought would be really fun for us to go out on is, when did you see your first opera and what was it? Um, and I'll start. So my first opera that I ever worked on was the first time I ever saw an opera. I was a junior in college and it was Johnny Skeeke, Swar Angelica, it was a double bill. Um, and I had such a great time working on it. But the first opera I was ever only in the audience for was La Boheme at New York City Opera Company. Hmm, sometime in the late 80s, it was after my junior year in college, so it was like 86, 87, and I sat in the first balcony, and I knew the story by then, because I had worked on a couple of operas, and I like put my hands on the rail, and in the third act, you know, after, during the trio, when Mimi gets discovered and she's coughing, I literally, like I started crying, like sobbing, not like gentle, pretty crying. It was like, <gasps> like I couldn't like stop myself. And I basically did that from that moment through the end of the opera. And I was with my boyfriend at the time and he was just like, like trying to hide because I couldn't <laughs> stop. But I was, I fell in love. I was like this, I want to be around this. So that was my mm -hmm. first. How about you guys? Tara, do you remember your first viewing? Yes, so I'll never forget it. We went to see Aida in um, Verona, in the arena, when I was about wow. 13, and I'd never seen her for life. It was part of a family holiday, and when everybody lit their candles and sang the chorus, I nearly lost my living life with excitement. <laughs> I nearly passed out. And I remember there and then saying to my parents, this is it, guys, this is what I'm going to do. Both of my parents are chefs and not musicians at all. And um, although I had been having singing lessons, this was a map off to their system. I think they presumed I also would be a chef. Um, but from that day to this, I never looked back. Nice. Mm. Wow. And how about Hera? I also um, saw... Again, Traviata is the first time. Um, actually, uh, <laughs> then was like, yeah. um, I when I was in art art high school, my father gave me the uh, gave uh, the present uh, as a present fifty DVDs uh, box, uh, and I just opened. I didn't know La Traviata could be the most famous opera ever. You know, I just like. Uh, spontaneously opened it and then played it. It was Plucky Domingo's um, uh, opera DVDs and it was so beautiful. Like, uh, I am from Korea. For me, like 
every like a little bit of different um, decoration in the architecture or like, the light or the candle or this kind of thing everything something was like totally new to me mm. and like these dresses we are wearing something totally different as a traditional clothes like we call hanbok um, and it was like uh, I, I I opened my eyes and it was such a it made me to become uh make maybe to have a broadened perspective in a way like wow i want to wear that dress i want to go <laughs> in that place how should i do that happen you know amazing so, yeah and I, I cried also so much at the end of the egg i i was fainted like wow it's so sad how come the beautiful voice can make a human being like so crazy so I, I I have to admit, even though I was in the art high school already and I studied classical music, um, but that was the real moment that I thought, whoa, this is very, very special. Because my singing was more started from the religious reason, uh -huh. like by praying and then chanting and singing in the church. So I was not really into the opera or classical music, but for me, just singing was part of my life. But that time really changed it. Changed it. Like, wow. thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. So I hope you all have the opportunity to see amazing opera, like what you're going to see in about five hours from four hours from now. Four hours from now. <laughs> you can see it scrolling along the bottom that the Hansel and Gretel will be available, and you get like 48 hours to watch it. Oh my along God. with all this other fantastic content that the summer camp's providing. Paula, Hera Hisung, Tara, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so delighted by this conversation. I know the campers couldn't see me fanboying out in the background here, <laughs> but I'm sure you could in the lower uh, lower quadrant of our, our video screen. I'm so thrilled. Campers, I just wanna give you a little rundown on what we can expect tomorrow and then Friday. And of course, as Paula mentioned, you can starting in four short hours, stream for free Hansel and Gretel, the Mets production uh, from the main camp webpage. That's metopera.org forward slash global summer camp. Totally free. You have 48 hours to get it all in. You're going to have a great time with this beautiful, beautiful production. Now that you've met some opera singers, you've learned about the opera, you've done some Hansel and Gretel cookie baking with Anthony Roth Costanzo. <laughs> You've had a great day. Great week so far. Okay, so tomorrow at 12 noon, we're going to have story time with an opera singer. This is for all campers. Of course, it's geared toward our younger campers, but everyone can enjoy this. This is with our special star <laughs> soprano guest, Christine Gerke. She's very, very excited. So we're happy, happy, happy to have her. Um, she's gonna read a very, very funny book that you'll all love. Um, and that will be live. And then later it'll be hosted on the New York Public Library story time page. So if you miss it live, we'll link it, but you can go watch it there, okay? And then tomorrow at uh, 1 p.m., this is all Easter New York City time, we're going to have a Career Corner Q&A interview like you saw with our fabulous stars, Tara and Hedda today, with the Metropolitan Opera's general manager, Peter Gelb. Peter Gelb is in charge of the entire wow. opera company. It's a very big job and he's ready to take your questions. So get ready, make sure you fire those into us, use the job form in your Google Classroom, submit a few questions. We'll be happy to take as many as we can get through in the hour. Okay, and then finally on Friday, we'll have our camper showcase. Um, and I know many of you are already submitting your videos. We can't wait to see it. So that's what I have. Any questions, you can email us at summercampatmedopera.org and keep uh, tagging us on social media, MedOpera student and hashtag MedOpera camp. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks, Thanks for that. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Nice to see you guys. <laughs>